Good afternoon and welcome back to Brave Embrace for 2022. I'm so glad to be here. You know, January is recognized as Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month. And um, it's really imperative that we stop and take a look at this issue to learn more about it and then also to hear from some professionals in the field that are making an impact. I have a very powerful duo here with me today, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to Allison Phillips and Dan Nash. They are co-founders of the Human Trafficking Training Center. Welcome, Allison and Dan. Thank oh. you. Yeah, you guys are um, like superheroes in, in this field. I know that, Dan, you have served on the front lines as a law enforcement officer for you know 27 years with the last 10 or so really focused on this particular issue, uh, making huge strides in, in the regional development of uh, task force and bringing agencies together that were serving it. And alongside Allison, who served as the director of our state's uh, you know, human trafficking task for response here in Missouri, and has moved on as a consultant to really get out there and get some of these lessons learned and also the techniques that are really able to help form our stakeholders, our professionals in the system to better serve uh, the survivors of this crime to make an impact for our community. So we're gonna talk about it today. Um, I'd love to hear just a real quick, um, as you like to call it, that 101 about really what does human trafficking look like, um, you know, in a local level for communities, either one of you. Well, with that one, Kim, um, first of all, thank you for inviting us on your show. I'm really happy to be here and have this opportunity to have this talk with you. Um, I, I think probably the simplest, broadest way I could describe what human trafficking is and, you know, people, that's one of the top questions we get. They want to know, what, what can I look for? And what it really comes down to is control. That's what human trafficking is. It's one person controlling another. And that, that can look like a million different things. But when we teach law enforcement or community members, any other group, that's, that's really what we start with by explaining. Um, it can look like somebody who can't speak for themselves. It looks like somebody who um, isn't wearing clothes that fit them or are appropriate for the season. Or um, it can look like somebody who's been branded with a particular type of tattoo that would dem demonstrate that they are somebody's property. Um, you know, it can look like somebody who is in living conditions that um, don't make sense, really, you know or somebody is controlling their money or ID. I mean, it, it can just be so many different things that you can look for in terms of like physical indicators, behavior, um, circumstantial, all those types of things. But human trafficking, um, you know, it's happening in all of our communities, not just the big cities. Please don't think if you live in some little town in, in rural Missouri or wherever in the United States, that this is not impacting you because all of, we all have these devices, right? And a lot of it is, um, that's where grooming, initial contacting, it's where it, things are advertised, um, you know, all these things are facilitated through, um, through online platforms. Um, it's labor trafficking in, a lot of it's in unskilled labor pools. It's happening, a lot of it is what we have thought of historically as prostitution. Mm -hmm. Actually, the way we teach it is that, that really what we should be thinking about prostitution is that it's an indicator of trafficking, because most of the time when you actually screen correctly, you'll find that there's some force fraud or coercion that's behind it. Um, so I, I don't know, that's my kind of two minute answer for that really big question. <laughs> That really helps, though, to break it down, kind of narrow it for us to understand. First of all, something I took away is that it is happening in our communities, whether urban or yes. rural. It might look a little different or have similarities, but it's vulnerable people, right, or in a situation of being vulnerable at a stage in life, and then someone seeking to control, finding the ability uh, through, you said, grooming and just that interacting, building relationship, kind of. Mm -hmm. Is that, am I taking that right? Yeah, and I think another good way of thinking it, I'm, I'm going to borrow the words from one of my colleagues that, that works in this. He, he describes human trafficking as the exploitation of vulnerability because all of these stories are different from, uh, you know, that we that we see with victims. They all are different, but really, if, if you analyze what, what it was that happened, it was some vulnerability that this victim had that the trafficker saw, 
you know, just really honed in on and exploited. Maybe, that's, um, you know, if you think about our victims that are trafficked through illicit massage businesses, most of them came from Asian countries. And a lot of times their vulnerabilities are they came from poverty um, or some kind of background of abuse. Um, a lot of the families over there don't put a high value on their daughters. And so when someone comes to them and offers them this opportunity to come to the United States and make a job, making income that they could never have otherwise, you could, that's how they exploit that vulnerability. Um, and, and it goes from there. Uh, a, a common thing we'll see are, you know, kids online who have all kinds of insecurities. Um, they're, they're oversharing they're, <laughs> through privacy filters and things like that. And uh, that can be a vulnerability, you know, that a trafficker will see in the room, that child, and finally convince them to, um, you know, to a in-person meeting of some kind, you know. Um, so vulnerabilities can look like a lot of things, but really that's, that's what it comes down to. You know, that's a great explanation because I, I think, Dan, about your career in law enforcement. And so early on, did you feel like you were interacting with what now you know might have been possible victims, you know, engaging with them on crime scenes or things and seeing a vulnerability, looking a few different ways, but not maybe seeing it with the label of maybe a possible trafficking um, is that true? So early on in my law enforcement career, I, I think it was probably the same for most is we didn't know what human trafficking was. We didn't have any training in human trafficking. And unfortunately, even today, about 17% of law enforcement across the country has obtained human trafficking training. So still a majority do not have training. Wow. Um, but I didn't have any idea what it was. And I remember in the late 90s, we would do vice operations and we arrested all these prostitutes and took them all to jail. And we really thought we were doing the community. We thought we were doing right by them. We thought, well, this is this is good for them. They need to go to jail and they'll learn that they can't be doing this. Right. We had no idea that what was going on behind. We had no clue. So looking back, I probably missed hundreds and hundreds of things that I should have done differently or could have done differently or could have screened properly. I didn't even know how to do that, but you know, all these different things that we could have done and we could have helped people. And, and that's really why I got involved in this was, you know, an, an incident where I, um, I thought there was probably something going on, but I really didn't know what to do about it. And I tried my best, I think at the time to try to do something about it. And then I found out a couple months later, this gal had committed suicide and was found in a bathtub in a hotel room. And she was being trafficked and she was 20 years old. And she had a little boy who was two, who, you know, was living with grandmother because he tested positive for meth when he was born. And she had an addiction and she was a cutter because she'd been abused as a child. And, and I missed that. And I really felt like I, I let her down. Mm. I, I don't know how, I don't know what to do, but I just know we can't go along this way anymore. And that's really where it kind of started for me of, we got to change this. We got to do something different. I got to figure this out. And that's, so yeah, I, I think it's pretty common for us to look back and go as a law enforcement officer, I didn't do that correctly. I see. And into lack of understanding and, and, and really clearly training, which it, it seems like such a simple thing for a citizen to consider that, oh, our stakeholders, our uh, law enforcement officers have the correct training they need. But it sounds like agencies have been maybe behind the, the needle a little bit or behind. I can't think of that little quick scenario to say, but um, in, in understanding this, because the way that you described it, well, first of all, I'm so honored that you shared that story in, in honor of, of her and her, her son. And I, I see how clearly at that time, feeling like, you know, trying to get her on the right path um, by an arrest or by whatever seemed like the best course and the only course maybe that you had at the time. But as you've broken it down, it, the vulnerabilities that she had due to maybe the lifelong abuse that she had suffered. So she was had an addiction in order to cope, which I think a lot of people can if they really stop and reflect, they can see times in their life where, where, you know, they have utilized things to, to get through difficult circumstances that make them not unlike some of these, these folks that you're now working with and serving and, 
Um, and, and to think that with just a shift, just a pivot, maybe the outcome could have been different. And, and I hear that you carry that burden and I really thank you for sharing and I'm honored to, to hear her story. And so, so years in law enforcement, you saw that gap starting to develop. You realized there was something more needed. So you formed kind of a special unit or, or pushed to form a special unit within your agency. Is that correct? To kind of take a look at this epidemic and see what could be done? So my agency decided that they needed to do something about human trafficking. Um, so we started getting some training and then they came to me and said, you know, we would like, I was in violent crime at the time and they came and said, Hey, would we in, in basically transferring over and, and doing this human trafficking thing and, and kind of building this thing. And of course I was like, well, yes, that's, I'd love to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet there was a lot of work to do because even though we had some training, there's a lot of things out there that law enforcement still was not doing correctly. And one of the things that I could not figure out, and, and there was no training at the time to, that I knew of to, to, to remedy this, was about 7 to 9% of these trafficking victims will disclose to law enforcement when they're contacted. So of all these girls that we're coming into contact with, only 7 to 9%. Most people are like, oh, well, don't they just say, please help me and wave a little, you know, a flag or hold up their hand or yell and scream. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're trauma bonded. They have PTSD. They have fear, fear of assault, fear of being abused, fear of being beaten up by their trafficker. So they don't say anything. So I, I could never figure out how can we get these girls to talk to us more? I mean, I was able to get these murderers to tell me they were killing people, but I can't get these girls to tell me they're a victim. So um, a way to do that, that we call the special victims methodology, and it it enabled us to increase and and handle these victims in a specific way that's really victim-centered and, 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 but also provides law enforcement with what they need at some point to prosecute traffickers and, and everything. And, and now we've been able to bump that number to like 50 to 60% of these victims will respond positively to that. And, and that's a, that's a, makes a big difference because we want to get our number one goal is to help them, get them into services, get them the help that they need. But our number two goal is to figure out who that trafficker is, get, the, get them in, in jail and figure out how many other possible victims that trafficker has. So, so those are really the goals. Number one, to help them. Number two, to figure out who the trafficker is. And number three, to try to identify any other victims. And this has enabled us to do that more efficiently and better. Wow. So by seeing that dramatic change in the possibility of disclosures is like reason enough to, to drive forward these new concepts and training. So when your paths crossed with, with Allison, Allison, you were you know directing a state level um, group to kind of not only enhance the, some of the trainings and organizations and things, but just to come up with a, would you say like a strategic plan or something to help the state kind of attack this, this issue? Absolutely. I mean, that was, that was my job is to, to bring all, all of the best people in the state together that do this work and, and, and build that multidisciplinary team because that, that's really how you are successful with this. Law enforcement can't do this alone. Victim advocacy can't do this alone. And we're used to historically kind of working in these silos and you can only do so much that way. But once you bring people together across all of these different sectors to work together on a single strategy, really amazing things can happen. And, um, you know, in, in all the years that I've been doing this work, and I, and I know you've seen this too, Kim, um, I would say, and especially in human trafficking, Law enforcement has been kind of the missing piece on this. And I really think it's a, a training issue. Um, you know, you, you can only, you know, we can teach people what human trafficking is, how to identify it. Here's the number that you call to report. But then what? <laughs> if you don't have good trained law enforcement on the other end of that phone, it nothing really happens. And, you know, and I know victim advocates can do, um, they can do outreach, you know, with, you know, on the streets or strip clubs or any of these places where this type of stuff is happening or being recruited and so forth, um, you can help and get people out. But really to be truly effective, 
you want, like what Dan was saying, you want to find out who the traffickers are. Um, if they're just going to go find somebody else and this, you know, that cycle doesn't stop. So uh, that, you know, that was my job um, with the task force, finding someone like Dan in law enforcement with, with his years of experience, with his leadership skills, with, you know, his victim centered uh, mindset, really, you know, just uh, an incredible find. We're very lucky to have him in our state. So well, no. and, and, <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's exciting to think that, you know, through that partnership and relationship, both of you are seeing some of the same kind of holes in the response and, and the need to really push forward that piece of training, not just about like the indicators, like you described mm-hmm. and kind of what it looks like, but really how to get, you know, get on the scene and help change lives. Um, and then also by making those informed arrests that are strategic with all the information you could gather from those, those victims then, then to really impact this crime. Um, so when you started looking kind of, uh, at a global level, a national level about, you know, what was happening in other states and where you could be most effective, what did you guys find about some of those training numbers and responses and things like that? So, I mean, clearly it varies from state to state. I think there are some states that are doing a, a pretty good job um, with their human trafficking. Um, they're developing good plans. They're developing, you know, proper training or they're, or they're utilizing, you know, some other proper training. Mm-hmm. There are some states that realize that they're, you know, behind and they're trying to catch up. Um, Allison and I have got numerous states that we'll be going to this year in 2022. I got one state that's do, we're doing five trainings in, another state we're doing three trainings in. Um, so there's there's states that are doing that, and then there's some states that clearly haven't figured it out yet as far as what they need to do, what they should be doing. So clearly, that's you know up to Allison, up to me, up to other people to try to um, figure out a way to convince them or show them. Um, that th- th- there are some other avenues to be taken and there's some other things that we can do to, to help these victims, to identify victims, to arrest traffickers, and that this really is a priority. Um, I, I joke sometimes, and, and, and I'll use this as an example, there are places in the United States, there are states in the United States that literally have more detectives that investigate cattle theft and agricultural crimes than investigate human trafficking. Now, that's not to say that if I was a farmer and had my cattle stolen, that would not be important to me. Mm-hmm. Clearly, it would be. But really, mm-hmm. we're, we're, we have more in detectives in some states that investigate cattle theft than investigate human trafficking. Mm-hmm. I don't know how. I don't know how that shouldn't be flipped around a little bit, mm-hmm. personally. Yeah, I I see how that must have been like a glaring kind of thing, light bulb that went off for you that we have focused there and somehow forgetting the intersection between what's really happening uh, and then also how it embeds itself in other crimes. So, um, Allison, when we were talking before, you had mentioned that this is the second most profitable crime. Is that correct? And what was the first? Can you go into that a little bit for me? Sure. So the the statistic is that... um, that human trafficking is $150 billion annual crime. So in terms of dollars, that makes it the second most pervasive crime on earth behind the illegal trade in drugs. And so, you know, if, if you think about, I mean, I, who does anybody in your audience know, can, I mean, we all can see the impact of drugs on our society. We all know somebody whose life has been impacted or taken from them by drugs really now. And, and to think that human trafficking is second behind that, and most people are surprised to know that this is happening in our midst, I, I, you know, I think that shows that there's some disconnect. And, and that trickles all the way through to our response. So like what Dan was saying, we have more um, investigators following up on agricultural crimes, cattle theft, than we do human trafficking. So you, you have people in these positions who are making resource allocation decisions with what kind of knowledge. And, and, you know, and when I worked for the state, that was a thing, and Dan will say the same thing, that was repeatedly frustrating because we were trying to get things done. We needed resources. And the people who were in those positions to make those decisions really didn't see it as a priority um, because I, they don't 
see it and they don't understand the issue. And so um, I think, you know, a lot of what's happening in our communities is just not being addressed at all. And it's, it's, it's something that we have to change. Yeah, it sounds like, like it, you know, on such a clear level. And so through the partnership, you saw the need and developed this training and technical kind of assistance organization, which I'm very happy about because, you know, in the news, I, we see all of these uh, reports on defunding the police, social justice, and, and all of these things that are happening. And I'm, I'm hearing about the states not connecting the dollars to this important crime. So my, my first instinct is, so wow, is there money there for training? And how are you going about facilitating and organizing these agencies to, to bring you in and to, to let you help them really help themselves because they get into this field for, you know, to serve and protect and because their heart is right. Uh, um, and, and so that information helps them, you know, do their job at, at such a high level. So what, what are you facing now in, in regards to that? So we get funding a lot of different ways for, for these trainings. We, we do have some law enforcement agencies that will contribute or, or, or pay for the training Honestly, as you just expressed, that is much more complicated now over the last couple of years. Historically, in the law enforcement world, you have rural law enforcement, urban law enforcement, and then you know you can have state and federal law enforcement. So rural law enforcement has never had money because they're small communities, small rural America, small tax base. So they've, they've always had you know, small budgets. They've never had money to go, oh, man, we can we can bring in all this training. Right. And then with the defund the police that started happening, then you had all these urban police departments that lost, in some cases, millions and millions of dollars. Well, one of the first places they take that from is training, which, you know, seems kind of crazy, but that's what they do. So it comes right out of training. So now you ended up with a situation where rural law enforcement and urban law enforcement didn't have any money. So a lot of what what funding we get now comes from the private sector. We have private businesses that, that get involved. Um, everything from, you know, it could be any, any kind of a private business, you know, it could be a bank, it could be an insurance company, it could be a law firm, it could be whatever that wants to get involved and, and, and help train law enforcement. Uh, we also get victim advocacy groups. We have a lot of those that get involved. We have a lot of faith-based groups and, and faith-based leaders that get involved. Um, and they're like, hey, we just want to help our law enforcement and we want to help our community. And that's really what it takes. I think Allison said this earlier. It's it's not just the police. It needs to be everybody. Right. Everybody has to take an interest and take a personal part in this. So if you can have the community that's coming together with private businesses that's coming together and say, hey, we'll fund these trainings and then we'll get law enforcement to go. That's exactly what we are. We've been doing with KCPD recently. We have like six trainings, I think, their total that we're going to do. And all of them are funded through private organizations and private funding and, and faith-based groups and other places. None of that has had to come out of KCPD's budget because they didn't have any money. But we're all, but it's allowing us to train these officers, and it has almost immediate results. Allison and I did a training at KCPD, and it's not just KCPD. It's other law enforcement that, that are allowed to go to in the, in the area. But literally seven days after one of our trainings, one of the officers called us and he was on a, a call, a disturbance call at a convenience store between a boyfriend and a girlfriend. And come to find out the boyfriend was trying to get the girl to go out and turn tricks for him. And she didn't want to. And they were in a fight. and He was punching her. And the officer recognized and saw the indicators and knew what to do. And he called us and he was excited about it because he's like, I wouldn't have known what to do two weeks ago. But now I saw it and he ended up getting that girl out and got her into services, got her into a shelter, got her into like a rehab, if I remember right. So now she has an opportunity to be out of that environment. And it happens very, very quickly. So to feel supported and not so alone where it sound, seems like in that situation, they would feel like they have lost all their choices and chances, right? And so in kind of backstepping to understand some of those vulnerabilities, oftentimes it's people just like us and children that find themselves without hope and without choice. So then someone through that control, as you explained, Allison, is then forcing them in 
really out of, out of survival. So this new information this officer got, I mean, made an instant, you know, impact. Um, that's incredible. Are you seeing and hearing some of those stories um, from other jurisdictions that you've been training? We are. We see it every time we have a training. It, it is within days. We'll, we'll hear back from, you know, at least one of them. Um, one of the trainings that we had just last month um, one of the officers, he was a school resource officer, the very next morning, I mean, literally less than 24 hours after leaving our training, he he recognized what was really going on with a 14-year-old girl at the school where he was. And, you know, it's, it, it's that kind of thing that really fuels me to keep going with this um, because it really does make a difference. You know, I just think about that girl in that school. I mean, you know, how, how many times was she being raped today? And now that's not happening. So it's, um, it, it really makes a difference. And it's something that I wish that the decision makers who are cutting training funding could understand that it's not just a class. It's, it, this actually translates into results that are saving lives. And, you know, and I, I especially love when they make really good arrests <laughs> because it's not just one victim. You know, all these traffickers usually have multiple victims. and you know, it, it, it helps stop that cycle. And so. Oh, absolutely. And, and just the, like you said, the results, that instantaneous mm -hmm. kind of result I hadn't considered the, the role of the school resource officer and this, the, you know, the relationships with thousands of students that they have. So what an important piece of the puzzle for them to have, not just the basic overviews, which I think, you know, we've been doing for a few years and, and that's good, but you guys have taken it to the next level and then some by creating these training modules and sessions that give results like that. So Dan, you mentioned the special victim methodology uh, course. What are, tell me a little bit about that. And then what are some of the other modules that you feel like are above and beyond and different now? So um, we have about eight different types of classes total that we offer. Um, most of them are geared toward law enforcement. We do have a community class that we, that we do for the community. We do have a, a class that's geared toward medical personnel as well because uh, doctors, nurses, they're in a very similar boat to law enforcement. There's research out there that says anywhere from 86 to 88% of trafficking victims will flow through the medical system while they are being victimized, but only 4% are identified. And when they started looking into that, it's clearly because nurses and doctors are no different than the police. If they don't know what to look for or what to do, then they don't know what to do, right? And they're not trained in nursing school or med school either, just like the police are not trained. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and we see, we've seen results with that too, where as soon as these hospitals get training, it literally starts changing immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so that's really important. Our interdiction class is probably the nuts and bolts and the foundation of what we teach, because that teaches, first of all, the change in mindset, that paradigm shift that we really want to teach in law enforcement that number one, the way you see these folks are, is different. So in other words, instead of looking at them as though they're prostitutes and junkies and hookers and hoes, they are victims because most of them are. The research is all pretty consistent that these girls are victims if you really screen them properly and if you, and if you really take the time to look into what's going on. So we teach that, that mindset change that they are victims, not just prostitutes and hookers and junkies. And then we actually teach them skills on what to do and what to look for and how to handle situations and how to talk to people when they're out on a domestic violence call or they're out on a suicide call or an attempt or an overdose or whatever it is and where they can look for these things. And, and what we see is that they go, wow, I thought this was an attempted suicide, but I think this girl's a trafficking victim. I thought this was just an overdose, but I think she's a trafficking victim. Or I thought this was just another domestic violence call, which in and of itself is serious enough. But I think there's also a serious, there might also be a trafficking thing going on. Um, and we, we've seen them I and we've seen victims identified in everything from an accident to uh, a loud party call to you, you name it, officers will find it because they're out there every day interacting with these people. And then we roll into like operations and how to do the investigation and then the special victims methodology, which kind of brings the whole thing together 
which really delves into the mindset, the psychology behind why victims don't disclose, why they're not holding up that sign saying, please help me, I'm a victim, right? Um, what goes into their to their psyche? We talk about trauma bonding and PTSD and 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 how prostitutes have higher levels of PTSD than our soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and and all the stuff that goes into that. And then most importantly, how to talk to them, how to interview them, how to handle that in a really victim centered way so that you can help them have this catharsis, help them be in control. You're not in control. They're in control. And at the same time, figure out how you can get this information so that you can figure out who the trafficker is and hopefully put them in prison. And, and it sounds like you do that in a way that it allows them to feel empowered and, and ready to not only give you the information, but also access some of the resources that you've explained that you both have mentioned the multidisciplinary team approach. Um, share a little bit more about what that really looks like. So I'll address that. Um, but I think first thing I, I would ex explain about that is most of these trafficking victims have had bad encounter. Their experiences with law enforcement have not been good ones. So in, in their mind, you know, if you've had 10, 20 or more bad experiences with law enforcement where they didn't help, did the other things, treated you poorly, said, called you bad names, all kinds of things and worse. I, I've heard from the survivors I've worked with, um, you don't see law enforcement as an option for you. And really, you know, I, I talked about what tracking is, it's, it's control. And so that's, that's a person who's had all of their choices and all of their options taken from them. And of course, they want to get out of this situation, you know, they might not be out asking for help, but that's simply because they don't know what their options are. And so what we try to teach through the special victims methodology is we want you as a law enforcement officer to become an option for this victim. We want them to see you as someone who is safe to talk to, that you're not going to judge them, that you actually have a safety plan that you can put in place, um, that they're not going to be further, um, you know, beaten tonight by, by their trafficker just because you were seen talking to this law enforcement officer. I mean, there's so many considerations and so many reasons why they won't cooperate or disclose. Mm -hmm. and, um, once you make yourself an option as a law enforcement officer to this victim, they're going to talk to you most of the time. And so by being an option, that means that they feel safe talking to you, that you have considered their safety that there's a plan in place that you maybe come up with shelter options to get them out of this situation. Um, they feel like you're going to believe them, uh, all these types of things. And that takes time to build that kind of trust and rapport, right? And that's what this, this is. We're not coming at you saying, I need you to tell me who your pimp is. Well, I'm not going to tell you who that is, right? Because I have to leave here and he's going to pick me up. And if I said who it is, he's probably going to kill me or beat me or whatever, right? So I'm not going to cooperate with you because I don't know that what you're going to do with that information. You don't have a safety plan in place for me. Um, all the other cops that I've dealt with have treated me very poorly. So no, right? But so if you build that relationship and that rapport and that trust over time, um, that's when that kind of cooperation comes along and you can really help make a difference for these victims. Yeah, I mean, it, it just seems... And not to minimize, but just on the surface, quick thinking, like some of elementary things that somehow in the role of executing their job, like you said, these myths and these assumptions have, have come to play in the way they view these, you know, these victims. And, um, and so instantly, they're not there to help, or even if they feel it in their heart, they're not able to really share that. So these training techniques and the ways in, of interacting really make a difference in just that basic ability to have those conversations to allow that trust to build. So that seems, um, you know, like just such a far advance of than just sitting down and saying, okay, tell me what happened to you, that kind of thing. Like, you know, to really understand that they're so, so, so complex. Yeah. I also saw on your website, I think it was Dan quoted as saying, you know, like be the one there is, you found that especially with children um, that oftentimes just that one safe relationship, that one safe person that they can feel open to tell some of these things, which 
often are very difficult and dark, right? And things that they may be afraid to even admit or share. Um, but, but even just by having that one person to connect can really set them forward. Exactly. And that be the one is, is kind of our tagline, so to speak. And where we really got that from was from talking to survivors. I, I found it really interesting that as we talk to survivors and, and Allison and I have talked to, you know, hundreds and hundreds, mm -hmm. that they are all law enforcement friendly. I've never met one yet that was not pro-police. And I found that really intriguing since most of them have had mostly bad experiences with law enforcement mm. and some of them a lot. I mean, you talk about Christine McDonald that you've interviewed previously. She was arrested like a hundred times. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they've had bad experiences with the police, but yet when you talk to them about the police, they'll tell you that they're pro law enforcement and they like the police. And when you ask them, why the police have never helped you or they were never treated you right. And this is what they almost always say is because there was that one guy that, or that one girl or that one officer that did help me and that helped me get out and was there for me that created this option for me. And even though I had 30 bad experiences, there was that one and inevitably that one is the one that got me out. So I found that really, really interesting. And so it's kind of a challenge that we give to law enforcement when we end our trainings is when you leave here today, you go and you be that one. You be that one that's going to help these victims. You be that one that's going to save someone today. You be that one that's going to save someone's life today. You be that one that's an option today that when they call at midnight, you're like, I'm on my way and we're taking you to a shelter. We're taking you to services. We're, we're getting you out of this. You be that one. Because if we can all just be that one, how many thousands of victims will we save and help? So that's kind of what we try to leave them with. And really that came from the survivors. That's, that's, that came from them because that's what they saw. Wow. So your training modules uh, include and are available also for, you said, medical personnel, advocates in the community, either uh, for-profit or nonprofit or a government agency advocacy program. So all are welcome. Is that right? Child advocacy centers. Yes. Um, yes. So Probation and parole officers. Oh. Mm -hmm. medical people, um, wildlife officers, natural resource officers, conservation officers, any police officer, any victim advocate, any medical people and probation and parole and department of corrections. We can train all of them. We have a, a special training for probation and parole and department of corrections because they see these things um, in probation and parole. They'll have these, these victims that are there for stealing or, or drug possession or something. And then once you teach probation and parole, they're like, I think she may be a trafficking victim. Um, we didn't know, right? Or the Department of Corrections can screen for that as they go into the screening pro or go through the screening process. So um, that's been a, a big thing, allowing us to identify victims and not only get them help and get them counseling and all the things that they need, but make sure that they don't, we intercepted, I don't even know how many calls we intercepted of these girls that were locked up in prison and the traffickers are literally talking to them on the phone while they're in prison, tell them when you get out in two months, I'm putting you back to work. So that coercion, you mentioned that Allison, just that coercion, which is, or like the implied threat of violence or the in, implied, this will happen. Um, setting all of that up, even while they're incarcerated, right? So the webs are woven so deeply. You, it does sound like it needs each professional at every point of engagement uh, to really keep speaking that hope, keep speaking, you know, the right messages in the right way to these survivors to allow them to move out of, you know, what they feel like is their only choice and live into some to some hope. I was thinking about the complex trauma of and some of this, the statistics you mentioned about the prior victimizations of many, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sur survivors and, and victims. So how are you seeing this playing out with, with children these days, like you mentioned, with the phones, access to internet and people out there grooming and seeking them. How do we make a dent there also? Ooh, great question. So, you know, if I have an audience of parents, perhaps, or you know, maybe adults who work in schools, 
what I want them to know is that this is the thing that you need to watch out for. It's it's not the, the you know kind of the stereotype stranger abduction, the guy in the van that you know snatching kids off the street. That's not it. I you know I think that's how I grew up. You know, learning that stranger danger. Don't talk to people, guys in cars that pull up alongside you or something like that. Right. Sure, we can teach our kids that type of thing. Don't talk to strangers. But um, what about the strangers that are talking to our kids on the phone who don't seem very much like strangers to them anymore? Maybe they're they're hiding their true identity or whatever. But you know, it it's it's really if you want to protect your kids, it's about teaching them to recognize what grooming is. That's really, and that's re- actually a way you can identify trafficking too. What is grooming? You know, the the patterns of it. Um, that's true for sexual abuse as well. Um, the, these predators, they groom. That's what they do. Um, they do it because they want to build that trust and rapport. They want to break down your barriers um, and, and get you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And I know you mentioned on our call previously that you're seeing this play out uh, in familiar family relationships. I can't say it the bigger way. I tried. It didn't come out right. So we'll just say family relationships, right? So in, in some communities, we're finding caregivers, uh, maybe trafficking young ones in their life for, would it be drugs or rent, anything like that, that they may need? Yeah, I'm, we've seen all these scenarios where you have people who are in these positions where they're seen like, you know, part of the community. They seem like an adult that, that cares a lot. I'm, you know, one of the examples that we give in our training is of a, of a guy in a rural community who was a priest at the church. Everybody loved him. And, and that's because he had not just, he, he was doing what he did, not just because he had groomed his potential victims, but he had groomed everyone around him um, to think that he's a good guy. He loves kids. He's, you know, he's doing all these great things, but it was, it, that's, I mean, that's what grooming is. And we really understand the patterns of it. Um, you know, that's what these predators and traffickers do. Um, and we've seen, um, yeah, it's it's not just kind of the, the stereotypical pimp. A lot of the trafficking that's happening is, is family members or, you know, someone that's respected and trusted by the family has that, you know, that earned that position of trust with, you know, the potential victim and those around them. And, um, you know, it can just look like a lot of different things. Wow, that was really empowering the way that you said that sometimes those that are grooming children with these ill intents have also groomed the communities oftentimes to to kind of think that they hold a certain regard and to have all this. I've never thought of it that way before. That's really profound and and shows the manipulative nature of, you know, of the perpetuation of this crime. And as you mentioned, child abuse and things like that, that our kiddos are at risk. I know there are some great programs. We'll definitely link them in in our notes as well, um, along with your website, because I just, you know, it's one thing to understand the basics of this, but I love two things about what you guys are offering. First of all, that paradigm shift, you're really helping people just like us every day, all of us understand the real complexity of this, instead of just looking at them and saying, that's a prostitute who is, you know, just out to turn tricks because that's what they want to do. But there's so much more to it and helping them break down the myths that they have and that carried, right? And, um, and change that. And then also the way in which you can provide services and tra- support for the victims, but helping those investigators to really feel as if they have the tools uh, and the awareness to, to see it, you know, right in front of them. You know, Kim, it, it, we were talking about this paradigm shift, because I like what you just said about seeing, you know, prostitution differently. I mean, if you think about it in you know, in our, in our country, we, we've done that over a num- with a number of issues over time. Um, 20, 30, well, maybe 30 or more years ago, we didn't think smoking was a problem. People would smoke all the time. You could go to the grocery store and smoke. Um, driving, if there was an accident and somebody was killed, the, the drunk driver wasn't held accountable. We just thought it was an accident. Domestic violence, you know. Why, why doesn't she just leave? I mean, I think our thinking on these things have evolved over time because we understand it better. And I think it's time for us to have that type of paradigm shift about prostitution. Nobody chooses to do that, truly. I mean, if you understand what the word choice actually means, 
And if you understand the ways that forced fraud and coercion play into it, it's just, you see it every single time. Um, and so I, I think um, if we can help create that type of paradigm shift through our trainings, we'll get a better response um, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll serve our victims better and as well as our communities because we'll hold the right people accountable. Yeah, it, it, it just, it, it, it's so exciting to, to see something that really is effective and you shared some of the results, but I'm just thinking of those informed, you know, uh, receivers of your training that just feel like, wow, I now can go out and really do something. My heart's always been there. Um, I've wanted to, and now I see things differently. So what are some things um, as you're, you know, out there and going, you know, nationwide now, and I'm sure international before y'all know it, um, but some of the things that you're facing that maybe you didn't think you would be or that, you know, are good or bad, anything? I'll mention one thing. Um, there are lots of challenges, for sure. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, but uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me is we, we hand out a survey to the officers at the end of the training where we ask them, you know, what they thought of the training and so forth. But one of the questions that we ask them is, uh, it, it's basically worded like this. It says, because of the training, the knowledge that I acquired today, I can think of situations now in the past where I realized I, I missed some indicators or now that I know what I know, I, I would do things differently. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? 95% of the officers who answer that question agree with that. So they are sitting in the training and, you know, rewinding the tape of things that they've seen in the past and go, and thinking, wow, oh, that's what that was. And now I know what to do. I would have done things differently. Um, and that's really powerful. So they're seeing this stuff and having this kind of education, this type of training is, is really powerful. I, you know, I think another thing I, I want to say too about, our, there are lots of people who, train law enforcement across the country. Um, and I, I don't doubt that many of, much of it is, is good, but um, you, you really do need someone with law enforcement experience background who has worked human trafficking cases to deliver that training effectively. It's the same thing with the healthcare workers. I, I'm not, I don't have a law enforcement background. I am not a nurse. I can teach plenty about human trafficking, believe me, but I can't teach a nurse how to, you know, screen in the, you know, in the, in the exam room, or I'm not going to be able to teach the officer, you know, ab about the specific kinds of evidence, when to get the search for it, all that type of stuff. You need to have those professionals with that experience to just not, not just teach them what it is, but what to do. And I think we've had that missing in the training that we've been delivering to law enforcement. They have been learning here and there some, you know, um, what it is, but they're not learning the skills of what to do. And so we're falling short. Mm -hmm. Well, and then as Dan was describing, just the. showing as well in getting out there, fighting these battles, fighting these political climates, fighting, you know, the cultures in some of these um, communities. I know it's, it's not easy, but um, a lot of the things that we focus on, you know, are bring about the, the darkness of these difficult moments in people's lives. And 
I just see, I see you both being, you know, the one, the one that's out there to inform and engage and inspire. And um, I know you sure have done that for me today. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Kim. I appreciate you. Are there any parting thoughts as we go? I definitely will have links to your amazing, great stuff for people to find. I know that we're going to try to work together in some sponsorships to get some of this training into some communities that are in need. And we'll continue to share that um, to other agencies that might be able to come alongside of you. But are there any other parting thoughts that you'd like to share? I would just welcome um, anyone in your audience to reach out to us. Um, we have trainings um, in a number of states and, you know, if, if they have some kind of sphere of influence that could drive more officers to attend, if they want to be a part of sponsoring a training, all of that would be fantastic. With that. Absolutely. Thank you, Kim, for doing this for us. Absolutely. I can't think of a better way to honor this month and the meaning behind it um, then by bringing attention to the great work that's, that's being done. And so again, I thank you for your time today and thank those that are listening. Um, and until next time, I want to encourage everyone to be brave. Thank you.